as I was saying, Aileen is our main moderator, Aileen Jabbar. So I'm just going to let Aileen uh, carry on and just uh, explain to you what the event is going to be about. Aileen? I'm sorry. Oh, yeah. am I I'm ready to start? Yes, you're ready to start. Oh, okay, fine. To okay. You. <laughs> okay, well, hello, everybody. Uh, many of us have fond memories of libraries from the pre-digital age. Certainly those wooden card catalogs with their little three by five index cards. And then the little paper pocket affixed to the inside back cover of each book with the due date stamped on a small card. Growing up, the library was our safe haven, a place where we go to do research, study with friends, or just curl up with a good book. And through story hours and other activities, our librarians created a sense of community within our communities. Although the card catalogs have been replaced by computer screens, libraries remain the same. They play an integral part in our lives and in our communities. And certainly these past two years, they continue to function and to reinvent themselves, making reading accessible to everyone. As Ms. Reader says in the Paris Library, libraries are lungs, books, the fresh air breathed in to keep the heart beating, to keep the brain imagining, to keep hope alive. Today, we're very pleased to welcome Janet Scarcely and Charles, award-winning author of Moonlight in Odessa and the Paris Library, who is speaking with us from Paris. Ms. Charles will share with us the remarkable story of the American Library in Paris and the role its heroic librarians played during the Nazi occupation. So welcome, Janet, and thank you so much for accepting our invitation to talk about the Paris Library. Well, thank you so much for having me. I'm just delighted to be here and so happy to see your faces. Bonjour tout le monde, hello. Bonjour, bonjour. Um, I, I have a ton of questions. And before we start, I know that people will have questions as we go along. So I'm going to give a general outline of uh, how we're going to uh, uh, approach the subject today. I'm gonna to ask Janet first to talk about the American Library in general and then its role during World War II, how she first heard about it, why she decided to write about the library, uh, then go on to how she conducted her research, the various characters, both real life and fiction, and then we'll go into reading and writing and uh, whatever else comes up. Okay, so um, if you have questions, you can ask them and they'll probably be addressed. You will see them addressed sometime during the conversation today. So maybe Janet can start by giving us a little history of the American Library in Paris. Well, thank you. And thank you again for coming. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, I wrote the book, the, the Paris Library, and that was actually the original title of the American Library in Paris. Mm -hmm. The American Library in Paris started um, as a collection of books, as a depot for books sent from America and Canada to uh, France during World War I. And so um, these books were distributed to soldiers and then as soldiers left, uh, the books remained behind. And so there was a question, what do we do with these books? And people in Paris had enjoyed checking them out, having this camaraderie um, in English. And so people came together to create the American Library in Paris. Um, some of the first trustees were Edith Wharton, the Millionaire and Morgan. Uh, so it was really, um, and the Countess Claire de Chambrun, who you read a little bit about in my book. So these were some of the original trustees of the Paris Library, um, as it was called at the time. So that's a little bit about the history of the library. And it's also something, you know, you refer to the people attending the library as members. And I didn't realize it's an independent library. It's completely private. So you pay a membership fee. Is that right? You subscribe to belong to this library. Yes. Well, during um, during the period I write about, it was open daily and free to the public. Uh, if I think if you wanted to check out check out books, you had to subscribe. But if you just wanted to go and read the newspapers and read or research during the day, you didn't have to have a membership. Now, yes, it's true. It's a private library and one needs a membership. And it's it's um, how is it was supported? How how was it financed? Through memberships and through donations. Through large donations. Mm -hmm. 
And the library, this was not the original, where it is now, it's on the, on the Rue du Général Camus, but it was not always there, right? No, the library started off um, it, in, I think it had four locations. One of the locations was the Champs-Élysées. Uh, yeah. My book is set on the Rue de Téhéran, which is near Parc Monceau. Uh, so yes, it's had several, it's had several locations in Paris. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so, um, well, we'll get to it maybe when the, based on the history, the, um, the, Book is based. Your book is based on a true story that took place during the the Nazi occupation. Could you share that story then with us? Well, would you like me to show you a little bit about the yeah. characters and things like that? Sure, yeah, absolutely. absolutely. There we go. So I hope everyone sees what I'm seeing. Yes. Okay. Um, it's not quite working. Let me try it this way. There we go. So um, let's start out in Paris. This is a map from the time. And if you see the blue arrow, this is Odile's neighborhood. And this is where the American Library was um, at the time. And so I mentioned that Odile lived across from the train station Gare Saint-Lazare which is, is just right here. And that she, um, that she walks by the um, Saint Augustin church. Here's Parc Monceau. And I mentioned that she goes up a narrow side street, which is right about there. Here, I mentioned the Polish library. Um, if you read the book, you'll recall that on day three of the occupation, the Nazis, uh, marched into that Polish library, which sits in the shadow of Notre Dame. It still exists today. And they stole the archives and books and sent them back to Germany. Um, here we have a black arrow. This is my neighborhood. So I live in the neighborhood of Bercy. And this church is right next to this set of train tracks. And this church um, was bombed during World War II because the, the Nazis were aiming for these train tracks and mi missed. The church has since been uh, rebuilt. This is an area where they used to carry, have barrels of wine. Um, Bercy used to be a wine area. And in fact, there's still a little vineyard. Um, now this area is a park. So I just wanted to situate you a little bit in Paris so that you see where Odile lives, where I live and a little bit of the action. Here we have a photo of the library um, in 1939. And as you read, staff comes from the US, Canada, Russia, France, Switzerland, and England. Our story starts here. And I'd love for you to remember this photo because we're going to come back to it. Uh, this is an information card of the American Library in Paris. And when I was researching this book, I uh, Googled obsessively and that really paid off because every day new archives are being added online. And so every day new things were cropping up. So this picture is an information card from the library. And it's really the beginning of my book and the end of my book, because if you, if you got all the way to the end of the book, you know the, the last words of the book are the American Library in Paris, open daily. Here uh, we have the picture, um, here we have the picture of that card. Um, and this photo was really the inspiration for my character, Margaret. And I think you can also see that I was very um, faithful to the library. I talk about the, the white pebbled path. I talked about the petunias or maybe uh, pansies, the half dead ivy in the urn. And of course, I love this, this picture of Margaret. And I talked about her wearing that wide, um, that wide hat and I just wondered what secrets she was hiding. Here we have August 1939 and war is on the way. The US ambassador advised in view of the situation prevailing in Europe, it is advisable that American citizens return to the United States. And here Miss Reader and her colleague Miss Turnbull prepared for war by putting important documents and books in the safe. September 1939, three days after war was declared, Miss Reader created the soldier service. 
Now, um, this was Quakers, um, people from the Red Cross, YMCA, all sorts of volunteers, putting together 100,000 um, books and magazines for soldiers, for French and English soldiers, Czech soldiers, soldiers in the Foreign Legion. And the library kept really good records. So we know that the, the record for wrapping a care package was one minute and 40 seconds. Um, I really admire Ms. Reader. Um, this month is, um, I think, Women's History Month. And of course, um, March 8th is International Women's Day. And I'll be thinking of Ms. Reader quite a lot on that day. She said, no other thing possesses that mystical faculty to make people see with other people's eyes. The library is a bridge of books between cultures. And I really love that idea and her belief in, in, in books as bridges. Here, of course, we have the Nazi occupation. And here we have a photo of Miss Reader that I found and purchased on eBay. Um, it was about $25 and probably the purchase of my life. Um, this book took 10 years to write and research and get published. Um, as, a, as a writer, um, my original editor and my original agent did not want to go out with this book. They rejected it. And so I had to find a new agent. And I sent out about 75 query letters that really targeted each agent. And every time I felt down about it, I thought, oh, Miss Reader can, can face the Nazis. I can face sending out five more query letters. So this photo was on my desk the entire time I wrote the book. And I just, I thought about her a lot. This photo was taken at the library in 1936. I'm glad that librarians today don't have to get up on chairs to do photo ops for their place of work. Um, I do admire the photo though. So on June 12, 1940, before the Nazis invaded Paris, Miss Reader sent staff away for their own safety. They went to the city of Angoulême. She remained at her post. And as you read in the book, uh, the directors dealt with Dr. Fuchs, the Nazi library protector. And as you know, she and her colleagues delivered books to Jewish members. I will mention that when I was researching the book, I was very surprised that Dr. Fuchs was a librarian. I just never imagined that Nazis could be librarians um, because of the book burning, I guess. And uh, I found a photo of him. I wrote to the Bibliothekstadt in Berlin um, to ask if they had any photos or information about him because he had worked there. So they sent me his personnel photo. And if you want to see what he looks like, um, which I will describe as a retired Sunday school teacher, um, you can check out my um, web website because there are some more pictures of all of the characters. Here we have another picture of her at work. Um, I absolutely love that huge telephone and wonder what she'd think of our telephones today. Um, she uh, actually began and ended her career at the Library of Congress. Um, there's a photo of Washington DC behind her. Uh, she also, after she returned to the United States, she raised funds and awareness for the Red Cross in Florida, which is where her parents live. And then she went to Bogota, Colombia. Um, where she trained uh, librarians there. So in the 1940s, Dorothy Reeder worked on three continents, which I find just absolutely amazing. Even today, not many people can say that. Here we have uh, the Countess Clara de Chambrun, who was originally from Ohio, and she was the only trustee to remain in Paris. The others returned to the safety of the States. I certainly can't blame them. If an ambassador told me to leave a country, I think I would. She too was summoned by the office of the Nazi library protector. The ALP, as you read, had been denounced because its collection contained anti-German journals and political cartoons. Uh, this is a photo of Clara Schembrunn in her home near the Luxembourg Garden. I found this photo online as well and purchased it. Like Miss Reader, she was an incredible woman. She earned her uh, PhD from the Sorbonne at the age of 48. She was a Shakespeare scholar as well as a novelist. She shared the same uh, publisher as uh, Hemingway, Scribner. She also translated Shakespeare's work into French. And you can look up her experiences in her memoir, Shadows Lengthen. So here's that original picture I told you about. And you can see Boris is standing in front of it and that gives you a little bit more of a, maybe a scope of, 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 the, of the height of, the, of those steps. So in 1925, Boris started out at the library as a page and worked his way up to the head librarian. He was originally from Russia and he spoke several languages. During the occupation, 
Boris um, was shot by the Gestapo and taken prisoner. He survived and worked at the library until he retired. I had the joy of interviewing his daughter, Helen, uh, um, for this book. Um, it was really a thrill to talk to both of his children. Uh, they said that he never quit smoking his beloved Jeton cigarettes. Um, his whole life he kept smoking. So even though he was shot through the lung, that did not slow him down. This is a photo of the staff. And this is Miss Reader. I think she looks different on, in almost every single photo. Here we have Boris again. Uh, this is Evangeline Turnbull and her daughter, Olivia. Now these are Canadian um, mother-daughter librarians. Can you imagine going to work with your mom? Um, I would like to go to work with my mom. I think that would be fun. Um, I know not everybody would want to. These ladies are really incredible ladies. Um, Evangeline married her husband, Captain Ollie Turnbull in 1915 in uh, Winnipeg. And then sadly he was shipped off to war in France where he died on the battlefield. Their daughter, Olivia was born a few months later. And so he ended up in France during World War I. And then here his widow and his daughter end up in France in World War II, also giving service. Uh, they um, were part of the soldier service that, that sent 100,000 books to soldiers. I'm, I'm just amazed by, their, by this family's destiny. Here we have the library love story. We have Helen Fickweiler, who was from Rhode Island, and she arrived um, in Paris just a few weeks, I think um, three weeks before war broke out, and um, Peter Ustinov. Now, some of you are old enough to remember the actor Peter Ustinov, and I got a chill when I read that Peter Ustinov had worked at the library, but it was not that Peter Ustinov. Um, so this is the library love story, and I was really happy to be able to interview their daughter, Elizabeth, and she was very helpful in um, identifying some photos and um, sending documents and things like that. Helen Fickweiler wrote her daughter, Elizabeth, a, a letter, uh, what it felt like um, the day that war was declared, where she was, um, how she and this reader reacted, and that's on my Instagram page. I just, um, I just included the letter in one of my posts. So. Um, if any of you are on social media, um, I hope that you'll, you'll follow and you'll, you'll have a, a look because these people's stories are so interesting. Now this, um, this is a mystery. This is Jeanette Etlinger and she's a Jewish librarian from Chicago who when war broke out had been working at the library for five years. And she, um, she disappeared and I didn't know what happened to her. And I only found out in January of 2022. And I wrote an article for the um, Chicago Tribune about how I found her. She ended up being in a German um, prison. She was a prisoner of war for 15 months before she was released in a, in a prisoner exchange between the US um, and Germany. Um, and so she returned safely home. But um, to Chicago, but it really is an interesting, her story is very interesting. So if you if you Google my name in the Chicago Tribune, you can find that story. And her story is really worth reading. Here is the library book plate from the darkness of war, the light of books. And I love how a book is open um, and how it vanquishes that sword and that rifle. There we go. All right, well, thank you for your attention. I hope you found that interesting. So if we move on, you, you're from Montana. Yeah. So uh, how did you first learn about the library? Were you, I mean, you moved to Paris or you were studying or how did you learn about it? I, um, well, I grew up next to a, a war bride. She was from Rouen, which is where Boris's children live now. And as a young person, um, I lived three blocks away from her. I wasn't very close. And I know that in the book, Lily and Odile are very close. Um, I was never close to the war bride in my town, but I just, as a child, I thought she was so brave. Even as a child, I understood how brave she was to leave behind her friends, her family, and even her language to marry um, someone that she didn't know very well, not knowing if she'd ever really be able to return to her home country. I just found that incredibly brave. And so that really inspired my love of French. And so I studied um, French in high school for two years, which is all we could do it in Montana, in, in my small town at that time. And then I came here to France as an exchange student um, when I was 15 for a summer, and then again when I was 17. 
when I was 28, I decided to come to Paris for a year as a teaching assistant, you know, assistante de langue vivante. And so I worked in a local high school for a year and I met my husband while I was here. So I kept on renewing my work contract. And then we got married. And as you know, that's a long-term contract and I stayed. Um, and I started working at the American Library in Paris as the programs manager. So my job was kind of like Rachel's and Aileen's where I found speakers and interviewed them or had them present their work at the library. And I, I had a, um, there was a, a, a a librarian who, who worked at the library for 50 years. He was Italian, an Italian gentleman named Simon Gallo, Simone Gallo, um, who I thank in my book. So he knew all of this, all of these stories, but he's very shy. And so I just happened to hear him talk about it um, with another colleague of mine who was preparing uh, an exhibit of past librarians of the library. And so that really sparked my interest. That was a long answer to your very short question. No, no, no. So, but then um, you, then, then you decide, did you ask around and say, is there more material in the library? How, how do I go about researching it? Uh, I mean, well, what, I did, did that, were you encouraged I, to do that? To, no, no. You know, the library is really all consuming. It's, it was a very busy job, so I never really had time to do any research when I worked there. And at the time, um, I don't think that their archives were, um, were organized. I think that's changed since then. But my research was mainly through the American Library Association, which had all of the correspondence from and to Miss Dorothy Reader. Uh, so I um, had thousands of pages of correspondence and history from the American Library Association that I paid to have scanned and sent to me. I did a lot of research at the Bibliothèque Nationale, which is right across the river from me. And they had, a, um, you know, they had the newspapers, the um, Paris edition of the New York Herald. Um, so I could look at these pristine, gorgeous newspapers. So um, I read the, you know, about a year of the newspaper, looking at the advertisements, reading what plays were popular, just kind of getting a sense of that time and place. I, um, I read a little bit of the Figaro um, at the same time to get that same sense. I read many, many memoirs of women who were here at that time from a madam, um, uh, at a place of prostitution. Um, I, I, I say that because here in France, I'm also a madame, but it's not quite the same. <laughs> um, I have, I also, um, there was a, um, an American woman who married a Frenchman. And when he was called up um, during the phony war, during the Drôle de Guerre, he would end up going to an army base and she would just follow and stay at a hotel. And so she wrote this really interesting um, memoir about her time following him and the impressions that she had and what was going on and she, she and her family tried to get it published in the 80s and 90s and no one in publishing was interested um, of course now there's a huge interest in world war ii um, and her um her journal or her um memoirs were published um Quite recently. So just reading all of these memoirs of women who were, you know, journalists or um, following spouses or working women, um, as it were, uh, gave me a sense of the of the place as well. So these are some of the things that I did. But the um, I had read someplace that when you originally thought about writing about the library that people told you there wasn't enough material. There to was make I guess a book. Simone said that someone had come and looked at the archives and and that person had had told the people um, who worked at the library at that time that there wasn't enough. Mm -hmm. And that's why um, that's why I say it's it's I'm so grateful for the Internet, because every day you every day new things were added um, every month new um, there with the Hathi Trust. Um, New documents are are scanned. Books are being scanned, or they come out of they come out of copyright, so they can be scanned and shared. Um, it's it's really amazing what you can what you can find um, online. So yes, he was he he looked at the at the archives of the library um, 
and said there wasn't enough, but I think I proved him wrong. I would think so. But um, in the meantime, you have a second story going on, which starts in 1983. Was that story already being written because of your neighbor from the wall? And, uh, and was that a story you were going to write before you knew about the library? I think um, I wrote, how I wrote this book was I wrote Lily's story first, and then I wrote Odile's story. And so probably the first 100, 150 pages were Lily's story, and then I went into Odile's story. Um, and it was really important to me. I know some people, I've read some reviews of my book on Goodreads, and some people say, oh, this Montana is so boring, don't need it, Paris, Paris, Paris. But as someone from Montana, from a small town, it was especially important to me to show that small town girls with big dreams um, have a rich inner life and that their stories are just as valuable as stories uh, of women or men from bigger, fancier places. Mm -hmm. And I know people have asked why you decided to write in two different time periods. Maybe you could share that with. I think it's really important um, to show the impact that we have on each other. And I think I think Odile never would have confided her story. And I think her story would have died with her if there hadn't been someone like Lily. I think Odile. I think Odile was really. Um, I did a lot of research about war brides, the Montana Historical Society in the 80s had um, had this project where, um, where they recorded the oral history of all sorts of war brides from France, from England, from Korea, from Japan. And so you can, you can read these transcripts and learn about these women's experiences. And a lot of the women were not welcomed um, in these small towns because they were viewed as stealing someone's sweetheart. They, they stole a hometown sweetheart. Um, and so I think we see that a little bit in the, in the book where the parents are not particularly happy to see this born bride. And so Odile um, is kind of like me in that she holds a grudge. And once someone has hurt her, she just doesn't want to have much to do with them. And so when, when Lily comes to Odile, Odile finds it harder to say no to a little girl, um, to a young person than she does someone her own age. And so that's in fact why we, we even have the story because otherwise the story would have died with Odile. She never would have shared. Well, and that almost happened anyway. Um, we've talked a bit about Miss Reader. Uh, I did want to ask about the difficulty, Miss Reader being a real life person, the difficulty when you write historical fiction of not having the person say things that they didn't say. I know she wrote this confidential report. Did you, some of the quotes that she has about believing in the power of books and making sure that knowledge is available, were those words that actually came from her confidential report? Well, she, I have her confidential report up on my website. So if mm -hmm. you're interested in her confidential report and the report of the Countess of this time, um, it's jsgeslincharles.com. Please look up their own words because I think, I think they say it better than I ever could. But Miss Reader wrote a huge amount to people at the, um, at, to the president of the American Library Association. Mm -hmm. So we have a lot of her correspondence, which is really lucky. And then she did some radio interviews. And so I have the transcripts of those radio interviews. And so I had a really strong sense of her personality. Um, but I was very, I think, I think at first I tried, I, I thought maybe she should be the main character instead of Odile, a fictitious character. But I found it very hard to put words in her mouth. And so, so I created Odile um, and I didn't feel so bad about putting words in Odile's mouth. But for Miss Reader, I, it, it was something that was, I, I, I really didn't want to put words in her mouth. But luckily, um, luckily there was a lot, of, um, a lot of material to draw from. Mm -hmm. um, moving on to other characters in the book, let's say some of the fictional ones, because we've talked about the Contessa and I'm gonna get back to some of these characters later on. Uh, 
Odile. Odile, you explained is uh, the name. You didn't explain where you got the name from, right? That part you haven't explained yet. No. So Odile, um, my first book was called Moonlight in Odessa, and it came out in 2009. And the booksellers here in Paris were really supportive of my book. And there was a really lovely Anglophone bookstore called The Village Voice, um, and it was owned by Odile Hellier. And she um, kept my book on her table for, she closed in 2012, she retired at the age of 70. But for, um, for four years, she had my book on her table. And for those of you in book selling, you know that um, usually you have a month or two before the next crop of books come out. And so you have a very short shelf life. And so the fact that she kept my book on her table for, for those years, I just wanted to say thank you. And so I named my main character after her. But is part of her... Um, in some ways, are you part of her or is she part of you? Oh, I think so. I think so, yes. Um, when I first started writing the book, um, Odile was a bit too good. One of my early readers said she was a mix between Yoda and Oprah, um, which is not what you want to hear. Um, and so um, I went the other direction and then she was just, I gave her all my personality traits and all my friends were like, this is a horrible person. I don't want to read about her. And so then, so, <laughs> so then I just kind of met in the middle between Yoda and Oprah and this horrible woman. But I think she does have a lot of my personality traits. And I think she, I think a, a lot of us know someone who just blurts things out and um, doesn't have a lot of tact and, um, and I think Odile, you know, she she did speak a lot before she thought um, and eventually learned um, from her mistakes, um, which not everybody does. But it's it's true. These things happen. Um, and when she said that the library is her haven where she always could find a corner to call her own, to read and dream and also to make sure that everyone has a chance, the people who feel different that they would have a chance to read and need a place to call home. Is that a little bit of you too? I think so, yes. yes. You know, I just, I love books. I just love books so much. Then we have Lily. Um, so you explained why she was important to your story, but is, some, is Lily is also autobiographical. Then you're a I little think, bit of both. I think Lily, the thing that comes from me with Lily is just her desire to get out. Mm -hmm. you know, just feeling trapped in that small town. And of course, at the time, I thought bigger was better. And now I know bigger is just bigger. Um, but you know, at the time when you're, you know, a teenager, you want those big lights and that bright city and, and the noise and things like that. And ironically, now that I live in a big city, I'd love to go back to quiet Montana. And if there were one more chapter, you may not see it this way, if, you, if there were one more chapter you could add to your book, with Lily going, I don't want to make a spoiler alert, but she leaves where at the end. What would the next chapter look like? I think the next chapter would have Lily walking into the American Library in Paris and seeing Margaret there, who Margaret still still volunteering, still hoping against hope that Odile will walk through that door. And maybe wearing the little red belt. Yes. Yes, a little, yes. And so I think I think Lily would be able to reunite the friends. Uh, the, the next person that I love is Professor Cohen. Um, what she she is fictional, I assume, but she based on um, now that you mentioned this woman, Jeanette, the, the, the Jewish person working in the library. Was she in any way based on Cohen? Was Professor Cohen based at all on her? No, because I really um, it was Jeanette Etlinger. And I didn't know what happened to her. She completely disappeared. And I was really scared for her. And in fact, what happened was she got married. So she went from ah. Etlinger to King, Jeanette, from Et Jeanette Etlinger to Jeanette King. And in fact, she was Mrs. Herbert E. King, um, which made it hard to find her. I think we should all be like the Spanish um, when we marry and, and um, you know, keep, keep the names. It would help us researchers out a lot. Ah, um, <laughs> but, um, but I will say, um, I think Professor Cohen is just a mix of all my teachers that I've had throughout my life. Just really wonderful, warm, giving people. 
I love when she says, accept people for who they are, not for who you want them to be. You can't change people, but you can change the way you see them. I think those are very profound words. Thank you. Well, you know, when I was um, when I was first um, living in Paris, I had a I had a student who was 80 years old, and she was a Jewish résistante, and she said those words. Um, she said ah. those words to me, and she just was really a wonderful lady, and uh, I really I really liked her a lot. She also said, "Books and ideas are like blood; they need to circulate." Very nice. And what about Margaret? Margaret's a survivor. The, so the, the epitome, I guess, of somebody during the war who had to survive. And we can look at her in different ways, but. Well, I, I feel a great deal of fondness for Margaret. And I think if anyone in the book I, I'm close to, it's probably her, because I feel like a lot of people who come to Paris have really high expectations of the city. Mm -hmm. And no city can live up to those high expectations. And, you know, Margaret, when she came, she didn't speak French and she had really a hard time communicating. She effectively became a mute person for a while. Um, so I just, I've had a lot of friends who've gone through those struggles and I've seen people struggle. Um, so I really relate to Margaret quite a lot. Um, she, To, to me, she's just a lovely woman. I know she she probably had some hard questions that she had to answer, and, and not everyone would do what she did, but uh, those choices were hers. Yeah. And was she your favorite character in the book? She, probably, she was, and Buck. I think I wrote a chapter for Buck, um, Odile's husband, and I had to cut it. Mm -hmm. um, I cut about 40 pages, and I was very sad to cut um, his story, um, but I think it was for the best. Um, it, at first, my book was called The War Bride and it really focused on her time in Montana, but then I started focusing more on the library. And so those Montana sections had to go. I think, uh, and, and what about Paul? How do, we, how do we think about Paul? I love Paul. You love Paul? Um, I love Paul and... Uh, well, of course, I love everybody. They, I created them all. Um, so let me tell you about Paul. Um, if you don't like Paul. No, it's not that. I just found that it was sad that he fell apart. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, I don't mean no. It's okay if you don't like him. I understand why you don't like him. He did horrible things. Um, but I will say he he had no one. You know, he couldn't tell anyone about what was happening when he tried to tell Odile who should have been able to help him and listen and and maybe be someone he could bounce his ideas off or find a solution. Um, he said, you know, these things that are going on, your father. And then she said, oh, my father, what does he have to do about it? And, and so Paul really couldn't confide in Odile. And so I think a lot of times that's really hard when you, when you don't have anyone to talk to. And I think his situation shows that that explosion that can happen. I think both Odile and Paul exploded Odile exploded with words where she blurted out um, Margaret's secret without thinking. I think that was a certain kind of explosion. And I think that Paul also exploded. His was physical, but they both punished Margaret in, 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 in terrible ways. But I don't think one is worse than the other. One is just physical and one is, is verbal. So to finish up on the characters, there's a lot of um, emphasis or let's say women very strong women play a prominent role in your book. And uh, I mean, all of them, the, from Miss Rita to the Countess, to Odile, um, to the professor, Margaret, even Lily's mother, they're very strong women. Uh, and I, I find it admirable that they were able to reinvent themselves and to do things that women didn't do back then. And also that somebody like, uh, Odile would decide that she didn't want to be defined, defined by a man and by marriage, but she wanted to be her own self and get a job and to be independent. And I just find that very admirable. Most of those women characters, they've got very strong roles. Well, it is really amazing, you know, to see women like Miss Reader, who, like I said, in the 1940s worked in three continents and, and um, you know, came to Paris all by herself, was told by the ambassador to leave the country and she still stayed. They they told her to leave the city, and she still stayed. Um, she was here at the very beginning of the of the 
um, of the German occupation. And I, I'm just in awe of, of these people and likewise the Countess who, who stayed. And even confronted uh, uh, Fuchs. Yes. The yes. enforcer that even yes. went to his office and said, I'm staying open, tough luck on you. Yeah, no, so they were really amazing. It really, really, uh, really incredible. And even Odile who delivered the books, I mean, it might have been an adventure for her, but to go and deliver the books to the Jewish patrons and to avoid the Nazis in the street uh, as well. Really scary. Um, I don't know if you read the um, Sylvia Beach, the original Sylvia Beach, who owned the first Shakespeare and Company. She yeah. wrote her memoir, and she doesn't talk very much about the German occupation um, or her time as uh, interned in Eastern France. But the little she says about it is really scary. She talks about how she and, and um, one of her Jewish colleagues went and sat in the park and just how she'd never been so scared in her life, knowing that, that they could be arrested just, just because her friend was Jewish and, and, and Jews weren't allowed to sit in the park. So it really, um, that memoir really brings home. There's another memoir um, um, by a young Jewish student named Ellen Baer, B-E-R-R, -R, that's been translated into English. And so she's exactly Odile's age and close to Odile's situation. She was a librarian at the Sorbonne and she was a student at the Sorbonne. But of course, um, she couldn't study um, any longer because of the laws that wouldn't allow Jews to study. And so you can read her journal um, and it's really, it shows how, how terrible that time, how terrible that time was. I also like um, even the fact that Professor Cohen was a former ballerina who ends up going to, to Paris and getting her agregation at the, at the Sorbonne and then ending up teaching at the Sorbonne, which was the man's world. Yes, and, yes uh, absolutely. So very admirable. So I don't know if there's any other questions concerning the library before we shift on to the subject of uh, being a reader. Is there anything in the chat, Mabel, Rachel, that somebody um, might want to discuss? No, for now, the only question we have is actually a question from Alice, because Alice is from Montana. So she was curious about knowing where Janet comes from. Alice is oh, our I'm receptionist. Oh, Shelby. Oh. Oh, so interesting. Yes, I went to school in Missoula, Alice, and uh, yes, and uh, yes, absolutely. Yeah, but we have no more questions for now, uh, Aileen. Okay. All right. So going back to you on the subject of reading, being a reader, did, when you were growing up, did you spend a lot of time in the library and were you a voracious reader? I guess I really loved going to the library. My mother, um, my grandmother never learned to drive. And so my uh, mother drove my grandmother to the library every week. And so we went to the library every week. And so my grandmother at the end of her life, the last 10 years, she went two places, the grocery store and the library. And from that, um, I learned that, you know, Books were just as nourishing as food, and you needed both. These were the these were the two things you needed in life. Did you have um? So she was like your like Aunt Caroline in the book. Perhaps. I think my, my my mother absolutely. My mother and and my grandmother were both voracious readers. Mm -hmm. Did you have a special teacher that also encouraged you? I had so many wonderful teachers and so many wonderful librarians. I was I was really really lucky. What were your favorite books growing up? I think I loved, um, well, I, there was a series when I was much younger about Madame Curie, amazing women like Madame Curie and Eleanor Roosevelt that I still remember to this day. Um, you know, when I was eight or nine years old, I think it's really important to read about what these incredible people do. And I'm glad that there are series like that that continue today. Um, I really loved Bridge to Terabithia, which I thought was beautiful. The Outsiders, um, there are just so many great books. And were there any favorite characters that you were sad to leave when you closed the book? I think I'm always kind of sad to leave characters behind. Um, so, so in the book, several times in your book, uh, the question is, ask the what kind of reader are you so if i ask you that question 
Um, I would have to say that I am not monogamous. I'm always reading three books um, at a time and uh, always, um, I just, I always love different kinds of books and do a lot of research. I love mysteries. I, I, I love biographies. Uh, I just, I love everything. This is what I'm reading now. I don't know if you can see. I think it takes place. It's a book that takes place where where you are. Yeah, well, which has not come out yet, this book, right? No, but it's it, where it, it, Rachel, how do you say it? Croton on? Croton on Hudson. Croton on Hudson. Mm -hmm. It takes place in Croton on Hudson. And uh, it's a really sweet book. It's called The Frederick Sisters Are Living the Dream. And so I just thought it was really interesting that I was reading a book that's situated not far from where, where you guys are today. When I read more than one book at a time, how do I keep them separate? Um, usually what I read is so different um, that I don't have any trouble keeping it separate. If I have trouble keeping separate things, it's language. Um, sometimes, um, sometimes my language skills, um, my French bleeds into English or vice versa. I had a friend who was writing in English and she said something was flaming new. And in French we say flambant neuf, but in English we do not say, to say something is brand new. But in English, we do not say it is flaming, not, flaming new, we say it's brand new. And so I make those weird little mistakes all the time. Um, that's what I have trouble keeping separate. Has your, chase, has your taste in uh, literature changed over the years? Are there books maybe that you would not read anymore that you might that you read when you were younger, let's say? I think. Um, no, I think I'm still open to pretty much everything. Um, I think what's really amazing is how you can read um, you can read um, the same book and it stays the same, but you change. And I'm, I think we can take a book like um, Their Eyes Were Watching God by Zora Neale Hurston, which is an incredible book. And I read it for the first time when I was 20 and I read it as a love story, a Goldilocks love story because in the book, Janie um, um, has um, three different men that she um, spends time with and they're, none are quite right. Um, one is you know, too um, controlling and another one, they just, they're just not quite right. So I read that as, as, as a romance the first time I read it. The next time I read it in my thirties as it was as a, um, a friend story because Janie and Phoebe in the book are such good friends. And then um, I read it again in my 40s and it was more of a, um, Zora Neale Hurston was, was a wonderful novelist, but she was also an anthropologist. And so I looked at it um, as a way that she captured language, as she captured place, as she captured people. And so the book didn't change, but the way I looked at it changed. And um, I mentioned this book quite a lot in my own book and I would really, um, I really hope that you'll look it up because it's an absolutely fantastic book. Are there any other books that have strongly influenced you in your life? Um, I think my favorite book, I don't know if it's influenced, but my favorite book is Bel Canto, another favorite, um, other than Their Eyes Were Watching God, Bel Canto by Ann Patchett. I just, it's really a, a book about how very different people come together. And uh, I really admire that book. Yeah, it's beautifully written. Um, do you, you read in French then, you said? I do, I do read in French, but I read more in French when I was in the States. Now that I'm here, um, I, I think I prefer to just read in English. And any, any special French authors that you like? Um, I think there was a, the, I think the last book I have in French is called Consentiment consentment and it's written by a it's written by a um a woman um who became an editor and she's also a writer and she talks about it's a tough topic because she she writes about how she was groomed um it's a it's it's her memoir about how she was groomed by a, a much older writer when she was only 14 mm -hmm. and uh it, it, it's a tough book to read, but I think it's an important one. I read that uh, somewhere that you had gotten a book um, uh, by Proust when you were growing up. Did somebody oh, my give uncle you a Robert. Yes, my you, uncle Robert gave me you a read Proust. Have you? Had, yes. had, did you get through it? Well, I I did, but uh, 
I just, I really, really loved um, my Uncle Robert. So um, I, he also gave me the book Thief. I really love that one as well. A lot of great works. So in this fast moving world that we have in the 21st century with, with short attention spans and everything is digital, how do you think we can continue to promote and encourage reading, especially for the, the younger generations? Do you think they'll still have the patience? I think maybe the last two years helped in some way, but do you think people will still have the patience, younger people, to sit down and read a book? And how can libraries continue to maintain uh, that interest? Well, I think one, one thing that's come out in America, it's been popular in France for a very long time, but it's the graphic novel. Yeah. There are just thousands and thousands of graphic novels that come out each year in, in France. And I would love to see America catch up on that trend because when I'm having a hard time reading, um, I love to turn to graphic novels because it, they really engage my senses. There's one called Dare to Disappoint. Um, and it's a fabulous, fabulous book that it, um, it's an artist. It's written by a, a, a Turkish uh, American woman who grew up in Turkey and her, she's afraid to tell her dad she wants to be an artist rather than an engineer. He wants her to be an engineer or doctor. And so she dreams of, of being an artist. And so you have all these different um, media that she uses to tell her story. And one is a stamp, you know, the stamp where we used to have the stamp, the date stamp to check yeah. out library books. She uses the date stamp to draw a portrait. So um, it's really incredible. It's called Dare to Disappoint. Um, so I think that's really the key to um, get young people reading or people who have a shorter attention span is to engage them differently. Um, and it's the same, I think, with books on tape or, um, or audio books, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, people ask me quite a lot, um, you know, about ebooks or versus physical books, but I look at, at audio books, ebooks, or physical books as do you want to take the elevator? Do you want to take the escalator? Do you want to take the stairs? You get to the same place. Mm -hmm. um, enjoy, you know, what you want to do that day. Don't worry about form. I guess. Yeah. Well, it's it's amazing in France how many you, you talk about graphic books. How many? I mean, we call them comic books here, but uh, there are entire floors in in the Fnac, for example, in the bookstore. With the entire floor is just all cart comic books. Yeah. And and adult and adult comic books. Yes, and they're exactly. very very popular. We don't have we don't. It's just as you say, coming here. We don't have that in this country. Um, I'm going to turn also, on the light because it's getting dark here. It's the middle of the day there for you, but sorry. I hope they're not, but yes. And also, um, I understand that there was significant uh, remodeling done at the American Library in Paris as well. So I imagine it's more, I'm going to go see it. I never saw it when I was in France. I imagine it's more of a media center now and more of, uh, with a lot of different programs. And maybe that's appealing and, and programs for teens and young and children? Oh, I think they've always, you know, I think they've always, I think libraries, all libraries, um, I'm just so amazed at how libraries, especially in the United States, have pivoted. I read recently a young man had a job interview and he checked out a tie at his local library. That yeah. is just incredible. And I just love how libraries in the States have adapted to the public teaching adult. I think some of the adult those adulting 101 classes, I think they were originally taught at libraries where, you know, people, um, you know, I'm 50 and I grew up with home ec. I grew up learning how to um, balance a checkbook at school, um, do cooking, sewing at school, and they're not not necessarily, now they're teaching computer skills and things like that. Um, and, and so some of those life skills we need, we're not necessarily learning from home or school. So it, the library has, really stepped up to help teach those skills. What did he have a date stamp on the tie and he had to return it in two weeks? <laughs> uh, did you always want to be a writer? I was always a writer. You were always a writer. Uh, as a child, you were a writer. You keep yeah. a journal and things like that. Yes. So you yes. all right. Um, and you were always you were always planning to to write the book in part of a book in Montana, at least you had always that idea, as we said, but um, when you started to plan out your book, 
did you lay out all the characters from the beginning or did you add and delete some as you went along? No, I think everybody who was started there ended there. Um, so I'm glad they all survived. Um, and, you, and you knew more, well, they all survived. Did you know how they were going to turn out at the, uh, from the beginning, how they were going to turn out at the end? Well, the first two drafts, you're right, uh, Margaret, or excuse me, um, Odile did die at the end. Mm -hmm. Um, and so it was much later in much later drafts, I got a flash, uh, this just idea that she and Margaret would somehow reunite. And so I knew I had to keep her alive. Mm -hmm. But in, you're right in those first few drafts, yes. Well, I, I don't know if I was right or wrong, but, but uh, no, because at the beginning, actually the second time I read the book around, I realized at the beginning what she was doing, Odile, I didn't realize why, when when Lily knocked on the door, I didn't realize that she had interrupted her yeah. from doing something that uh, would there would have there wouldn't have been a book actually. Um, did uh, the book took ten years to write, as you said? Did you expect it to take that long? No, no. I thought I was done in twenty thirteen. Um, oh, really? Yes, and uh, um, I had already moved on. I, I'm actually working on a book set in World War I about a, a, an American librarian who works just miles from the front in Northern France. And so I thought I was hitting that book just in time for the um, centennial, the, 19, um, the 1914, 1918 centennial. Um, so I was way off, um, way off. Uh, but and that's because you can't find it when you're writing. So, you, yeah. Are there any writers out there? Because if, yeah. if there are writers out there, start now because it takes longer than you think. <laughs> Don't wait. Start now. Did the research is that? Did the research keep coming, and that made the story made it take longer? I think. Um, I think it was hard to find an agent who was interested, and it was hard to. Um, I don't think I knew how many World War book were out there because I kind of I wrote with blinders on I didn't look at the at the market so much and so when my book was finally acquired and I opened my eyes and I saw that there were just hundreds and hundreds of World War II books I saw that the market was really kind of oversaturated and this could be one of the reasons why it was it was kind of a tough sell and did the first chapter when there's the interview in the library, did you have that chapter from the beginning? It, it, the way it, did it play out that way that it was going to be an interview at the library? That was always in the book, but the first the first part of the book was was completely um, was completely um, Lily section. So the first hundred pages were Lily section. So we started with Lily um, in church. Mm. Okay. There's a there's a, a just a question. Um, while waiting for her interview, Odile opens up a book to a random page. She's, she's looking for a book for Remy, and she says, "I never judged a book by its beginning." And she goes on, "I open to a page in the middle where the author wasn't trying to impress me." And I'm curious, how important is it is the first chapter to the success of a book? Well, I I will say I think now there's a big pressure to really grab the reader. Um, and shock the reader. And I see this even with Netflix. I watch, you know, the first episode of a show and they always think they have to be so dramatic or over the top. And I kind of miss the days when you could settle into a story and just enjoy the voices and things like that. Now, all of a sudden, you, all of a sudden you have to have the hook that, that, first. That, that hook on that first page or in the first mm -hmm. minute of a of a tv series and i think it's kind of too bad because i think it's better to let it's better to let a story evolve and then when something happens you already care about the characters okay but uh, but i i think in publishing to be realistic you you do need that hook right away did you uh did you show while you were writing? Did you show? Do you show parts of your books to friends, or do you have a reading group, uh, an author's group, a writer's group of any sort that I, you can share with? I have a writer's group. I'm somebody. I work a lot by myself, so it's really nice to share work um, with other writers and get feedback and give feedback and hearing how they perceive the story is is always very helpful to me. Um, and I love reading 
people's work. I love seeing how crappy first drafts can become magnificent books. It's, and just to see the time and the years that someone puts into something, it's extremely gratifying to watch them on that journey and help them a little bit on that journey. So I really love being a part of a writer's group. And, and what was, you, you talked a little bit about the challenges of getting a book published. So what is the process exactly? You, you first have, an, you have to have an agent? Um, and I think if you want to have, you know, like a New York big five publishers, they call um, Penguin Random House, Simon & Schuster, um, et cetera, it, you do need to have an agent. And so you have to write a, a pretty strong query letter. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so I think you can even Google how to get published online and, and which was not the case when I first started out. It's very nice that um, nowadays it's open for everyone. You don't have to know anyone and it's not really a mystical process anymore. You can, you can there are agents who help you um, with um, posts online, help you write that query letter. Um, my query letter um, started, it's World War II, Paris is occupied, there's a war on words. It's Nazis versus American librarians and the librarians win. So, um, but the but you didn't, but your book wasn't taken right away. No. No. Very patient. I guess that's another piece of advice for an aspiring writer. You got to be patient. Yeah. Patient or crazy? I'm not really sure which. <laughs> I don't know. I, you know, I'm, you know, it, I, I just believed in the story. I believed in the story and I took pleasure in writing the story and researching the story and, and talking about the story. I know of a, of a writer acquaintance who her writing group actually had an intervention with her. She'd been writing the same story for 10 years and, 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 and they intervened and said, we can't read this anymore. You need to move on. And, um, and that's very painful to me as a writer um, that, that kind of story. So I don't, I don't really know. I was, um, I did have, I went through two writing groups because I think when I first started writing this group, people in my writing group said, you can't do this. Um, and so I actually switched writing groups, which was very hard. Um, so there were a lot of ups and downs. Okay. And your book has been translated into about 30 languages. Um, how quickly does that happen? Um, well, in my case, it happened pretty quickly because my book was sold at auction, so that made some noise about the book. Um, but, um, for example, um, I think my first book was sold in 2008. Um, and it, I, for five years, I, I, every once in a while, I would get an email saying, oh, Greece bought, a publisher in Greece bought the book, you know, in 2012. So you just never know. You just never know. With. And and in French, your book is called uh, "Une soif de livre de liberté," a thirst for books and for liberty. Who decided yes. upon that title and why? Um, well, I'll show you the book. Let me see if you can. Yes. So this is the cover in French, and um, I think I think the selling point of the title in English is Paris. People enjoy Paris, and people who read books generally are pro library. So it made sense to call it the Paris library. But a lot of people in France um, who live outside of Paris think of Paris as pollution and traffic. So the word Paris does not necessarily sell in France. And um, just like New York, you know, some people just think New York City is crime. And, um, and, and they're kind of scared because it's such a big city, you know, in Montana, a lot of people say, Oh, New York, nice place to, 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 to visit, but I wouldn't want to live there. You know, it's just, you know, they kind of were, we are intimidated by the city. So Paris doesn't sell in French and librairie or bibliothèque, librairie, um, there's kind of a confusion with those words. Um, so um, the um, publisher herself decided on this title in Soif de Libre de Liberté, A Thirst for Books and Liberty. And my book came out during the confinement here. Um, and we really did have a thirst for freedom and for books because everything was closed and you know even the even the public gardens were closed, you could only go, um, you had the right to go in just one a range of one kilometer, you had to have a, a piece of paper 
um, where you gave your, you'd have to print out your name, your address, um, and the reason you were going outside, um, whether it was for grocery shopping, whether it was to go to a doctor's appointment, whether it was for um, exercise. And so you had to have it dated and, and time stamped. Um, and you had like one hour. So it was pretty, that first lockdown here, they were, they were taking it very seriously. So it was a, it was a suitable title. And, and I think what it wasn't it, I read about Shakespeare, the library that they were actually sending books to people's homes. I think, yes, I think, yes, I think some of the bookstores were, um, I, I, I know, I, I think, I don't know if they op were operating or not at that time. I don't know. And who decides upon the cover design? Did you have input into that or? Um, they asked, yes, they asked. They were quite nice about it. And I thought they did a lovely job. Because the covers are different. And now just one last thing. Also, your book has just come out now in paperback. It's a different cover design from, um, from the, the hardcover. The colors to me look like the French version, but it's just come out. Is that like a almost when you have a paperback come out, it's like a relaunching? I think so. I think so. I personally wait for paperbacks because I'm a traveler and I always have a, a uh, I always have a, a, a book in, in my purse or my backpack. So I personally wait for the paperback. Um, there, there's nothing that would make me buy a, a hardcover because I just, it's not practical for me. Um, so um, for people like me, um, I guess the paperback is a good thing. Okay. Um... That's, I, I know we don't have too much time. So I'd like to switch maybe to just your experience in, in Paris. Uh, you live there now and Lily was fascinated with everything French. Did, you said that you felt that way when you were growing up. Uh, early in the book, when Lily asks Odile about Paris, Odile says, the best thing about Paris is that it's a city of readers and books are as important as the furniture. Did you find that? I mean. I, I do think people read a lot here in Paris. You know, there are so many bookstores and um, in France, um, booksellers, including Amazon or, you know, the big supermarkets can only discount books 5%. And so that means that it makes no sense to buy books off of Amazon. You might as well go to your neighborhood bookstore and get it because there's, there's absolutely no difference in price. So I think there's really a strong book culture here. And also, um there is there are shows on tv that attract readers religiously like like um uh what is it called that grande librairie for example yes, and before yes, that it was are, it was apostrophe yes yes absolutely they do have they do have books um they do have shows about books here yes which which we don't have or well, regretfully you'll have a maybe somebody who'll talk five minutes about a book or maybe there are blogs but we don't have that the same thing as in France. And there's a lot of support for the small bookstores. Yeah, well, I think that's coming back in the States. I think we've realized that we really need our, our bookstores in the United States. And I have to say in the United States, I think Instagram or Bookstagram, I'm just amazed by the creativity and the beauty and the talent of people who write about books online on Instagram. Um, I, I'm on Instagram, come follow me, I'll follow you. It's really interesting to it's really interesting to see. Just and Odile and the love of books. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Odile also says that Paris is a city that talks to you. And we know that, you know, over the years that Paris has certainly inspired a lot of American writers who live there. Do you feel more creative in Paris? Do you feel a difference? I feel like it's hard to write in Paris because there are so many other things you could be doing. You need to write in Shelby, Montana. You, you know, there's not, not much to do there. Um, you know, uh, so I, it's very hard for to write in Paris. It's very noisy. Um, and there's always construction. You know, it's a beautiful city, but there's a lot of maintenance. Um, I always, it doesn't matter what part of my apartment I'm in, there's always construction. To get away from my apartment, which was noisy, I, I rented an Airbnb. And um, it was in Paris and it was actually worse because um, in my building, they were only doing construction on one side of the building. But in the Airbnb that week that I rented it, they were doing renovation in the courtyard <laughs> and on the street. So I couldn't get away from the noise. Um, I'm really, I'm not really lucky noise-wise, I guess. 
And, and Odile also tells Lily that what she misses most about Paris is family and friends, people who understand her, speaking French, feeling like she's home. Can you tell us what you miss most when you're in Montana and what you miss most when you're in Paris? I think when I, of course, I miss my family when I'm, when I'm here and it was very hard to, to be here um, during the, especially 2020 when I couldn't go home. So that was really, that was really hard. Um, and uh, I think when I'm, when I'm in Montana, I probably, in, in Montana, I feel like where I am in a small town, um, the, the fruit and vegetable truck, I feel like we're the last stop from California. And so we kind of get all the bruised fruits and, and mealy, you know, mealy apples and sour, <laughs> sour oranges and grapefruits. And I didn't really know that I liked fruits and vegetables growing up. But here in Paris, we're the first stop. Mm -hmm. Everything comes through Paris. Everything that arrives here comes through Paris. And so I can really see the difference. Um, and of course, my friends like who grew up in California um, and you know had all that beautiful fresh produce or fish and things like that, they don't feel that way. But as someone who grew up only knowing fish sticks, um, <laughs> I never really um, had fish or you know fresh fish, things like that. Um, and so I think that's for me, just the, 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 the food. Um, but I think that's really particular to growing up in small town Montana. And as an American living in Paris, do you see things differently from different points of view? As, as they say in the book, putting yourself in someone else's skin or in someone else's shoes? I, I think so. I think it really helped me. Um, I think both of my books talk about, about about someone living in a different country. And so I'm really interested in people's journeys, whether it's getting a new job, getting married, um, getting divorced, uh, widowhood, um, starting, starting a new job, moving to a new, new city or a new country and how we deal with those challenges or how we deal with those ups and downs. And so I think I definitely had to live somewhere else to write about that. Mm -hmm. But and I don't know if I have to come as far as France. Well, it's true, though, that many of the characters in the book do try try to reinvent themselves and do reinvent themselves. There's so many of them. And I think it's a very interesting aspect of the book, including especially Lily, who wanted to draw herself a whole new life. I just find that very interesting. And I sure you have two lives there going on. Um, we're going to we're almost near the end. And I wanted to uh, just go back to two things, the American Library in Paris. And uh, as first uh, subject, it's just celebrated what it's 102nd anniversary. So um, what do you think has contributed to its longevity? I think, I think people who are passionate about books. Okay, <laughs> that's very easy. And um, the second thing is, what did you want readers primarily take from your book? Um, I think the importance of treating each other right. And um, the importance of, of how we think about each other or how we, uh, how we talk about each other. And um, when we are wrong, um, to say we're wrong and to apologize and to mean it. Yeah, this is true. That's a whole aspect we didn't go into, but there's a whole lot of, a whole gamut of emotions and from, from envy to shame to resilience to immaturity. There's all kinds of aspects of, of the book that we could be talking about. But I think um, I'm just going to end now. And I don't know if there's another any other quotes, but I mean, any other chats, but I'd just like to end with one quote. And then if we have any people have some questions, they can join in. It's Miss Reader who says, a library without members is a cemetery of books. Books are like people. Without people, they cease to exist. I just think that's a beautiful phrase. Um, do we have any? Uh, th there were just a few, there were a few questions in the chat. Uh, first, I'm going to start. There was a, a question from Pamela who wanted uh, if you could repeat the name of the American woman from Chicago uh, because she would like to read about her. Uh, her name was Jeanette Etlinger. Mm -hmm. Oh. Janet at Ninja. Okay. And uh, uh, there was a question from uh, Nicholas who was asking, uh, so did you say that someone described Odile as a cross between Yoda and Oprah or between Yoda and Okra? 
Oprah, Oprah. <laughs> yeah. I should enunciate. <laughs> and uh, I, I had a question myself because uh, you said uh, the, the publisher said there's a, a big market and there's a, already a lot of books talking about uh, World War II. Uh, but I know that in France, books about World War II are fairly popular and uh, movies about World War II are also fairly popular. So I was wondering, have you been approached by anyone to adapt your book as a film, as a movie in France? No, no, I had no interest from France or from Hollywood. So. Yeah. Because I thought, you know, it, it seems like a scenario that could be interesting from a French perspective, especially, as you said, you know, uh, during 2020, everyone uh, saw that, you know, the, the lack of freedom and how culture was important during this kind of time and during trouble. And so I thought, you know, that would be something that would probably work in a movie and, and, int and be interesting to a French audience in particular. Oh, I would hope so. Yeah. And um, then, yeah, go on. Yeah, no, Aileen, I was going to say there's no more question in the chat, but if anyone wants to ask questions, you can type them in the chat and, uh, of course, uh, we, we will answer them. Otherwise, uh, Aileen, I think, uh, was there anything else that you wanted to ask? No, I'll, I'll do a little conclusion at the end. I just want to mention there are also a lot of books that I've been attracted to lately that have to do with libraries. And uh, what was the last one? I think like The Giver of Stars, which was another era where, where um, books were delivered by horseback and mule because uh, Eleanor Roosevelt had this program to bring books to uh, rural areas. And there's a, I, I find these books on libraries in that whole movement very, very interesting. So I don't know if, if there's another thing I will conclude now. And I just want to thank it, Janet for sharing the Paris Library with us. And a grand merci, uh, Rachel who is the executive director of the Alliance Francaise of Westchester for her assistance and to Jean-Pierre Jabard for actually reaching out to Janet in the first place and finding her. And lastly, to thank you to all the members of the Alliance uh, for joining us today and for all the guests. And we look forward to reading with you again soon. Uh, thank you very much, Janet. Thank you, yeah. thank you so much. Very informative. Thank you, thank you Janet. Yeah. I don't know if you, have, you have everybody on. Thank you. Thanks, and, everyone. Uh, we'll keep in touch. Yes, merci. And uh, I wanted to thank you all for coming. And again, I wanted to thank you, Aileen, in particular, for doing all this work and thinking about all the, the relevant aspects, because I know you had to do a lot of research yourself about the library to better understand the book. And, mm -hmm. uh, and so thank you for, for all this. And uh, thanks to our cultural committee for organizing this. Merci à tous. Merci, et à bientôt. À thank you. À bientôt. Merci. 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 Merci.